Good morning, Tweb. Welcome back to my Atlas mapping series, Housekeeping. Off camera, I got rid of uh, a lot of the map outside the bounds of the page just to speed up Illustrator a little bit. I've done this using the Shape Builder tool as per the uh, previous episodes. I also changed the name of the continent and I added a little circle up here into the uh, compass rows. Housekeeping done. So in this video, we're going to look at uh, starting to label our map. Specifically, we're going to look at labeling our countries, cities and towns and putting in some boundaries. Basic plan here is that I'm going to talk you through how I created these things and then at the very end I'm going to do a time lapse of me putting them in on the map, all while answering your questions from the last two videos. So let's start with boundaries. Now I realize place of interest is not a boundary but I just put it in there for the sake of it. I think this is all fairly intuitive. The only thing to note here is that when you create symbols for your borders, always think in terms of hierarchy. So like my international border is the fattest out of all the borders. It has the most detail, it's the most important. And then you work all the way down to a park, which is relatively thin, has very little detail. So what are some of the conventions surrounding boundaries? So we go over here. These are the colors that are frequently recommended for boundaries. In this series, I'm going to be using this one. Obviously, simple borders are just a matter of drawing a line and giving that line a stroke, like so. More complex boundary lines are just multiple lines layered on top of one another. So if I copy this guy, bring him up here, I'm going to copy him again. I'm going to give him a new stroke color, black say and I'll make it maybe half the width of that line. So we have this blue gray line in the back and a black line in front of it. Now let's give that a, a dash sort of structure. So we go to stroke, we hit dashed line. In this instance, I went with five points, five points, five points, five points, 15 points, five points. So basically dot, gap, dot, gap, dash, gap. And this is kind of like industry standard for international borders. Some sort of solid color plus a dot, dash line as per what I have here. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh cool, he's gonna make a custom brush out of this. I actually don't make custom brushes out of my more complex borders. Uh, the reason for that is that we always wanna place our borders on top of physical features and physical features tend also to form boundaries. So like borders running along a mountain ridge or rivers, etc. Therefore, if I draw my border as two lines, I can make the back line transparent so I can see the river in this case, and I can keep the top line opaque so it visually it pops. If I were to make a custom brush and apply opacity to it, I would get something like this, which looks really weak. So I tend to, for my more complex borders, I tend to draw them in separate lines. So these are two lines, this is two lines, this is two lines, and obviously all of these are singular lines. And the only other thing to worry about here from a stylistic point of view is that when you have a border, you don't want it to overlap ocean boundaries. So if we look here, this sort of weirdness is going on. We want to avoid that. And this can simply be done by drawing your border as usual, taking your land layer, copying it with Command-C, Command-F, holding Command-Shift and then right square bracket to throw that new copy up the top of the stack and then killing the fill color. So bringing the fill to the front here and then hitting forward slash. And then all that we're left with is the stroke and that stroke nicely covers up here. So you always wanna have ocean boundaries being on top of any internal boundaries. So using those tips and tricks, you should be able to mimic something like this, what I have here. The wall here is a little bit different. Obviously it would be an absolute pain to draw in each and every segment of a wall along our map. So we are gonna use a custom brush for this. So to do that, simply draw two squares, press M on your keyboard for rectangle tool, click and hold shift to draw out a perfect square. Then hit command C, command F to copy the square you've just drawn and drag that new copy over until it snaps into place like so. Then hit P on your keyboard for the pen tool, select a stroke, so bring stroke to the front here, select the stroke of black or whatever color you want to use, and then go click, click, holding shift to maintain straight lines. Do something like that, and then we can get rid of our guides. Select all of it, hit Command C, Command F to copy it, drag it over, until you get something like this. Chances are you're gonna to need to fix this bottom point if they don't meet up, so simply select your shape, go up to stroke, and then hit this chap 
to fix that and then select everything and hit G to group. Now go to window, brushes and hit the plus tool here for new brush. Make a pattern brush because the wall is just basically a pattern. Hit OK. For your corner segment up here, select auto centered. This can stay as it is. For this sort of internal corner segment, select auto centered as well. These can stay the way they are. Here you can choose stretch to fit or approximate path. Stretch to fit is where Illustrator doesn't maintain the exact proportions of the shape you fed it, but stretches it so it exactly fills the path you are drawing. Whereas approximate path doesn't stretch it and it keeps the exact shape you've made, but there could be some glitches if it doesn't fit evenly into the path you've drawn. So experiment with it, see which one suits. Uh, name your brush. So I'm gonna call this wall brush. And then I'm gonna hit okay. And this pops up in here. So now if we hit N on our keyboard, we can draw a, a nice old line here, select the line, and then simply just click on a brush palette here to make a wall shape. Now that's obviously massive, so we can reduce our stroke down somewhat to make it uh, look a bit nicer. Now notice though that when we initially turned this into our wall pattern, it started off with a stroke of one. That stroke of one now represents the size of our original pattern we fed Illustrator. So my advice is draw extremely small so you can increase the stroke. Uh, you, if you draw too big, there's only so far you can drop down the stroke before there is no stroke. So draw small and feed it into the brushes. So that is all you need to know in order to create a set of boundary iconographies. And with all that done, let's look at countries, cities, and towns. Two disclaimers here. Again, the uh, purpose of this video is not to give you a tutorial on how to name places well. It's purely a style guide, a cartographic style guide. Second, uh, Disclaimer is that the reference atlas I was using, I lifted these towns and cities from that reference atlas. It's about 20 years old, so I suspect some of these populations have changed over time. And I also suspect that some of these places are no longer called what they were called in that arc atlas 20 years ago. This is only here for demonstration purposes. So the country section, again, is fairly self-explanatory. The only thing that's a bit weird might be this internal division thing, first order and second order internal divisions. Um, if you're from the UK, think the UK versus Scotland, Wales, etc. If you're from the States, think of the country as being the US, think of the first order division as being a state and think of a second order division as being a county within that state. That's kind of the nomenclature I used up here anyways. And again, just like with the boundaries, we have a hierarchy going on here. So the country is for me the most important. It gets the biggest, it gets a, a serif font. Overseas territories are differentiated again based on font style, weight and capitalization. And same thing for the entire list. Try and make each category visually distinct. A general pro tip here is you want to keep serif fonts for physical features like mountains, rivers, oceans, that kind of thing. And you want to keep sans serif fonts for hu human or cultural features like cities, towns, etc. I haven't quite done this here and this is mainly because my reference atlas breaks away from the mold a little bit. But certainly up here, we see that all of these cultural things are all sans serif. They're all arranged by population. And population is shown again using hierarchy. Hierarchy is so important here. The hierarchy here being symbol size and color. So these set of symbols versus these set of symbols. And capitalization, all caps versus mixed caps. And font weight, bold for, for very large cities, regular for smaller cities. And the built up here area here is basically to show metropolitan areas. It's simply a shape with a yellow fill and a dotted black stroke all around. So let's talk a little bit more about conventions and how to make these things. So these are the colors you'd be looking at for your city and town symbols. These are kind of a standard set. The symbols themselves tend to be made up of some combination of circles, squares, and or stars. Now you might recall that uh, weeks ago, we looked at using the blend tool to create a color spectrum for topographies. You can also use it for symbols. So let's say we want to create a star. So to do this, we're going to go up to our rectangle tool at the side here. We're going to click and hold and we're going to go all the way down to star and then i'm going to click anywhere here to bring up a star let's make it sure a five point of star not i'm not really concerned about the radius now hit okay perfect and let's say it uses this color scheme for example uh, let's say that's the symbol you want for your biggest city and let's say you want 
uh, a teeny tiny star for your smallest cities. Instead of having to manually work out the sizes in between them, you can select both of them, go up to Object, Blend, Blend Options, go to Specified Steps and choose how many more symbols you want to be placed in between these two. So I'll say, I'll go four for the sake of it. I hit OK, nothing happens, that's totally cool. Go Command, Alt, B, or go Option, Blend, Make. Like I said, the blend option works with colors. It'll blend two colors together. It'll also blend shapes together, so you could morph a star into a square over time using it. It's a really cool way of generating symbols, and that's exactly what I used to create my set of symbols here. So that was a quick little look at how to do symbols. Let's talk up now about text conventions. This is probably the biggest section of this video. There's a lot to, to say about text here. First point is that uh, the minimum text size you should be using depends on the medium you're working in. If you're dealing with print, you can get away with about six to seven point uh, text sizes at the smallest. If you're dealing with online stuff, you can get away with maybe about nine to 10. You have to go a little bit more for online. For your countries, territories, areas, etc., all non-point labeling. You wanna stretch out the text to fill the area it's representing. So if I'm depicting France on a map, I want to take the word France and stretch it out so it fills the entirety of the land that we call France. And we do this using tracking. So you simply write something, go up to character, and then go down to tracking and increase this number to stretch it out. Only rule to follow here is that your tracking should be less than four times the letter height. So this is our letter height and this is four times the letter height. Do not go any further than that, otherwise the letters begin to lose relevance to one another and our brains don't tend to look at them as being all of the same word. So tracking less than four times the letter height. Now for all point features, so that's cities and towns, etc., with an accompanying little symbol, we wanna make sure that we're not using tracking for the most part, so just plain text. And we wanna make sure that the text is is no more than one letter height away from the symbol. Again, this is just to make sure that your the brain is able to associate the text and the symbol. And also, you don't need to be re, you don't need to be massively precise with this. You can eyeball it, but just keep these rules in mind, and everything will kind of look that bit more professional. In terms of where we place text around our symbols, not all positions are created equally. The number one position and the one you should always try to go for is up and to the right. So if that's our city label, the city name should be up and to the right of the symbol. If that doesn't work, more on that later. Down and to the right is your next best option, followed by up and to the left, followed by down and to the left. All of these kind of work. Again, heavily favor this one up here. What we do want to avoid though is we want to avoid having our labels be centered on our symbols, both above and below. Don't do this. Also, don't do horizontally aligned. If we have to rotate our text, Again, not all positions are created equally. We want to heavily favor, obviously, straight up horizontal text. Thereafter, these three are okay. This is fine. These ones we absolutely want to avoid because essentially the letters are upside down and that's no good for readability. And finally, we want to make sure that when we're labeling towns and cities, if we can, we want to shove text into the sea because the sea is obviously less important to us than the land. There'll be less stuff to mark in the sea. So dump as many symbols as you can into the sea. So here's my landmass, there's my little coastal towns, there's the sea, and all of my text is in the sea. And note that I'm following the guidelines that I outlined a second ago. This guy here, the label is up and to the right, and I am about one letter height away from it. This guy here, up and to the right, up and to the right, up and to the right. Now here, up and to the right would not work because we'd be overlapping this. So next best option, down and to the right. And for these three, we couldn't do up and to the right because we'd be overlapping the land, giving us no room for more labels. And we couldn't do down and to the right because same thing. So next best option, up and to the left. If you follow these guidelines, you'll end up with a very cohesive looking kind of um, typographic style to your maps. Oh, and finally for color, in terms of countries, uh, cities and towns, just stick with plain black. Don't do any color variation. When we talk about physical features later on, like mountains and uh, labeling oceans, we can use colored text. But for the labels considered in this video, just go black. It's best not to deviate from that. So with all that in the bag, it is uh, time-lapse time. I will see you in a bit, internet.
let's start off by doing some follow-up to my fifth Atlas map video, Scale and Cartouches. What has YouTube got to say? William Nicholas writes, How do you go about making an atlas that doesn't include oceans? Say, a Mars or an ice planet? Thanks. So, cartographically speaking, the easiest thing you can do here is just have positive elevations, no negative elevations. So take the lowest point on your planet and measure all elevations up from there. Alternatively, think about how time zones work on Earth. Like, we measure all time zones off Greenwich Mean Time, which is entirely arbitrary. So you could do the same thing on your world. You could take a site of scientific significance, say, like a university or an observatory of some description, and use that as your zero elevation, and have your culture count up and down from the elevation of that site. Or if you're on a planet that used to have an ocean and people know where that ocean would have been, you can go with regular sea level sort of elevations like on Earth, except you're measuring off an ocean that isn't there, if that makes sense. So there's a couple of different ways you can, you can handle it. Daniel Rossi writes, You can also create the graticules using the blend function that you used on the first video of this series. I suspect that would work to a degree with Mercator, but probably would fall apart with Equidistant Conic, for example, where the graticule grid is a lot more complicated than simple perpendicular lines, but still a cool little exploit that could work in certain instances. Quinton Corrett writes, Is there any particular reason for the window you chose to display? It seems weird to me that the second continent is only partly showing in this otherwise beautiful map. Thanks. First of all, thanks for thinking that the map is beautiful. That's really nice. So yeah, I chose to keep the second continent on the bottom there because I, when it came to borders, which you're hopefully watching right now, I wanted to have a l international land border and also an international sea border. So my justification for this was that the culture from that main continent in the bottom right corner took over a little bit of land on the main island. Again, just so I can demonstrate various types of borders. Nine times out of ten, if I'm doing something that seems a bit quirky, it's probably for demonstration purposes. Nathaniel Beckon writes, Edgar, you can alt-drag for duplication instead of Command-C, Command-F, and then drag. That is another way of doing duplication for sure. For me though, Illustrator gets a bit wonky and sometimes it rejects it, like it just moves the shape as opposed to duplicating the shape. Command-C, Command-F for me works every time. But like with any good software, there's usually a couple of ways of doing each task. So what I'm doing here is but one way. There's always more ways you can explore. Tom Rouge 13 writes, Command F for paste? Is that just an illustrator thing or a non-American thing? Over here it's Command V. Both of those hotkeys work in Illustrator. Command V pastes to the center of the screen and Command F pastes in place, so directly on top of what you are copying. Hmm. 
Okay, so that was some YouTube. Let's see what my subreddit has to say. U slash seal 44 writes, somewhat unrelated question, what's your favorite map projection? Pretty much the ones I outlined earlier in this series. I don't have a favorite because different projections do different things and depending on context, I might choose different ones. And to recap, some sort of cylindrical projection for equator regions, equidistant conic for temperate regions, orthographic or stereographic for polar regions, and then Molweda, Robinson, Winkle Triple, etc. for world maps. U slash gam underscore masters writes, how do you come up with interesting continent layouts when using such an obtuse form of drawing like G plates? Drawing straight onto a globe like you do in G plates is strange and it does lead to kind of weird results at the very start. Largely, this is a matter of practice, but I think a lot of the interest in terms of interesting continents comes from looking at what plate tectonics will be doing and being inspired by them. Like very often I'll throw down a whole bunch of quasi random fault lines, check to see that they all make sense at one another, and then begin mindlessly crafting a continent and hey presto at the end of it, something really cool and interesting pops up. Also, and I realize this answer is becoming a little bit of a meme at this stage, look at what the earth is doing, look at cool shapes of continents on earth um, and be inspired by those as well. And if all else fails, just draw something really interesting on a flat surface, import it into G-plates, trace over it and fix any weird distortions you find. Next up, let's do some feedback from the sixth Atlas Mapping video, Compass Rose. Let's see what YouTube has to say. Or Harrington writes, how do I get my already made world into G-plates? I have some basic sketches, but it's not very realistic. So this follows on really nicely from the last point. If you're drawing using software, make sure you draw on a two to one canvas and then just go to file, import, import raster inside of G-plates Hit OK on the dialog box that pops up and all going well, you should have your map wrapped around the globe perfectly. If you're using pen and paper, draw a two to one aspect ratio grid, draw your world map within that grid, take a picture of it, send it to your computer and import that picture into G plates. Same way, file, import, import raster, hit OK. The two to one aspect ratio part is really important. What you're doing is you're creating an equirectangular map and it's, it's the projection that we tend to use in order to derive other projections. Tabitha M writes, are all compass roses from all cultures four pointed? My guess is no, there's a lot of compass roses that don't have any of the points. They just look like protractors really. Also, they can be kind of eight pointed in a way because a lot of compass roses will also show magnetic north as well. So there's a whole bunch of variety there that you could exploit.
Yevheni Diomedov writes, The aspect ratio feels a bit off in this video. Did you record it in 16 to 10 and then accidentally squish it to 16 to 9? No, it wasn't an accident. I deliberately squished it to 17 to 9. I record on a Mac. Mac screens are 16 to 10. The YouTube aspect ratio for videos is 16 to 9. So I have two options. I either upload the video undistorted and I have those big dirty black bars on the side of the video or I upload it distorted and it fills the screen. I chose the latter. Uh, I might try the former in this video, see how people react to it. Um, either way though, it doesn't change the underlying message of the video. But yeah, the, the compass rose looks a little bit elliptical in, uh, in Atlas map number six. Patrick Musselman writes, While north at the top is the current convention, it wasn't always. East up maps were used in medieval Europe and emphasised the direction of the sunrise. North up maps come about due to navigation charts, where it's useful to have up be aligned with where the compass points. Map orientation can have some world building significance. Fully agree with all of that, literally just reading it out so other people would hear it. <laughs> And again, the purpose of this series is to kind of outline cartographic conventions. And my hope is that people will kind of learn the rules in quote and then warp them based on their needs for their world. Okay, and finally, let's look at some of the comments from the subreddit for Atlas Map number six, Compass Rose. You slash Rec Jensen writes, think portal land charts will be worth covering? For anyone who doesn't know what a portal land chart is, it's basically an ancient nautical map. I'm pretty sure most people would know them to see them. It's that type of map that has a whole bunch of lines crisscrossing each other in the sea. I hadn't considered talking about those antiquated nautical charts again because this is a very kind of modern cartographic convention series but that could be an interesting thing to look into if i can find some sort of methodology on it then yeah perhaps but don't hold me to that this series is already super duper long Anyways, those were some of the comments from the previous two videos. Time to end the time lapse and wrap this bad boy up. So I think I'm going to leave it there for today. Obviously, a little bit more work left to do in terms of labeling, but I'll do that off camera. It's more of the same. It's still in a pretty rough state, like I haven't tidied up a lot of the edges in terms of borders and things like that. Again, something I'll do off screen because it's just an extension of what I talked about earlier. Again, it's worth mentioning that this series is about cartographic convention. So any inaccuracies with regards to like settlement distribution and things like that is a result of me just glossing over that for the sake of this art tutorial in a way. There will be videos, main videos on artifact scene about how towns and cities work, where they spring up, how to develop, etc. Again, this is more of an art series than a science explainer. I hope you enjoyed. We'll be back soon for more labeling, roads, physical features, etc. Talk to you then.
Good morning, Interweb. I know things are a little tight at the moment, what with COVID-19 and all, but if you're lucky enough to have a few quid extra stashed away and you really enjoy the stuff I make, consider heading over to patreon.com forward slash artifexian. Links also in all the usual places. For less than the price of one cup of coffee per month, you can help keep Artifexian on the air for free, for all, forever. So if that's a thing that you are interested in doing, patreon.com forward slash Artifexian. Again, links in all the usual places. Regardless, thank you so much for watching. Thanks to all my current patrons for helping keep Artifexian going, including Alexander Roper, Andrew P. Shahale, John Hoyer, Rip De Passe, Spencer Brownlee, and World Anvil. You all are amazing. Until next time, Edgar out.